Hello and welcome to another Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversation at Falling Walls 2021. Um, I'm Zulfi Karabani and um, we're very happy to have with us um, Jose Alain Sayer uh, of uh, the University of Pittsburgh, Department of Neuroscience, but also Sorbonne University in Paris. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Excellent to have you here. Um, this, as I'm sure you've been following uh, the Falling Walls conversations, breakthrough conversations, is an opportunity for us to bring you uh, and scientists together, researchers, um, developers, innovators, entrepreneurs together in a conversation where we can talk about breakthroughs, um, a, a much disputed term in the scientific community, the term of breakthroughs, but in any case, talk about the research and to get you to give you the opportunity to engage and ask questions. Um, if you do have a question, um, please use the raise your hand function in Zoom as you would anywhere. You'll be noticed, spotlighted, and then unmuted, and, and we'll turn to you and ask you to ask your question. Um, if you have any technical issues, uh, just write a little message in the chat, and our technical team will help you with that and, and solve that problem, but I'm sure it should be quite smooth. Um, one other thing you should know, it'll be audio only. Um, that is, your question will be audio only, but we are recording these sessions, um, so they'll be available later on, but you should know that as well, that we're recording this session. Um, I do believe that's pretty much all I've got on in terms of housekeeping. Let's get into the conversation. Now, this is something... Is, I mean, I find really kind of, kind of amazing, actually. Uh, I want you to, if, he, if I could ask you to start off by talking us through this very, dare I say, it, human story of a patient who learned to regain or have sight after 20 years and your involvement in that, your work there. Can you tell us about that science? And what, is, is it a breakthrough for you, for you? Do you see it as a breakthrough? Or are you also one of these scientists who says, breakthrough is a very difficult term to use? Well, I think it's, it's a term that became popular over the past uh, few years. But uh, actually, breakthrough uh, is more a reflection of uh, cumulative work that occurs over the course of many years and sometimes decades in my case. And after that much amount of time, failures, drawbacks, and some successes, at some point, there's a threshold where it makes a difference. And people see that. So this is the visible part of many, many years of hidden research that nobody notices. Mm -hmm. But uh, so it's more progression than revolution. But uh, breakthrough is the time where things become uh, obvious. So uh, clearly, when a patient would, couldn't see, is telling you that he sees something, it could be qualified as a breakthrough, at least for the patient. But if you look at that from a scientific point of view, it's really the combination and accumulation of a lot of work by many people over many years. And can you, can you tell us, talk us through the story of, uh, you know, in reading my, my briefing notes and, and reading about this story of this one person who was sort of like a, a standout patient in a sense in your research. Can you tell us, give us an idea, but, you know, bring us the person into the, bring the person into the room for us. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the, well, it's really the encounter be between the personal story of the patient, his personal journey from vision to blindness and then back to some level of vision, and our own journey towards developing an approach that could help patients. So, and w my life as a clinician scientist is bridging the gap between the two, talking to this patient, meeting them every week, hearing, hearing about their stories, their expectations, and also their impatience, saying that we are not as fast as they would like us to be, and uh, us working in the lab, working in technology, Technologies to try to find solutions that could fit the need. So I'll start with the patient journey. I'll mention how we ended up proposing that to the patient and then our joint path together towards today. Uh, so the patient has a disease called retinitis pigmentosa. It's a genetic disease that uh, affects uh, around 2 million people in the world. And this disease is due to mutations in genes that are coding for proteins that are very important for detecting the light and transforming the light into a signal that is then processed and sent to the brain. Uh, there are many genes that can cause that and uh, they all converge on a common pathway where patients lose initially dark adapted vision, then peripheral vision, and eventually central vision and become blind. Uh, the patient himself, uh, he had uh, some vision problem when he was a teenager. He was brought to an ophthalmologist by his parents, uh, and they told the parents that he had 
uh, this condition, but the parents didn't think they should tell the kid, so they didn't tell him. And when he was uh, a young adult and uh, already a professional uh, doing free university and a very educated man, he found out that he had problems. So he went to another ophthalmologist who made the diagnosis, told him about that. When he told his parents, they told him, well, we knew, but we didn't want you to be uh, afraid of that. And then over, for many years, he was able to work and uh, perform. His visual field was getting narrow and narrow and narrow. And uh, as he says in the movie I, mentioned, I showed this morning, one day he fell in the subway. Uh, and uh, it was very dangerous. So his physician told him, well, you, I think you have to stop working. So he was 40. He was working in a actually US company. And uh, he was fortunate enough to keep his income, uh, at least part of it, while he couldn't work anymore because he was blind. And for the past 15, 18 years, this patient had been blind. And he was seen in, our, in my department, in, my, in our clinic. We, we could see him on a regular basis because we follow thousands of patients with this condition because we are developing a range of therapies for this patient, gene therapies, prosthetics, and this type of approach. Let me just jump in there. Where, where was the research in this genetic condition at that, at that point? You mean the research on the genetic condition is uh, understanding the gene defects. So this is something that uh, we, uh, occurs in many labs and now is routine diagnosis on the gene defect. Right, so at that, but that, at that point, what, were you able to just say, look here, take the, you know, in inverted commas, take this pill, you'll be all right. Um, you know, when he, your, the patient was diagnosed and he had to stop work at the age of 40, yeah. what was the journey from there for you know, for your research, was it, you know? No, there was nothing. Uh, so, I mean, uh, when I started to work on that, and many of us worked on that for the past 30 years, there was just nothing. When we started that, uh, this project, we started that 12 years ago. The only thing that we started to emerge was artificial retina, which I'm working on also. But uh, this type of approach was not existing at all. So, and uh, this patient, when he was diagnosed, what usually a physician would tell so you don't have to come back, I have nothing to do for you. This right. was so, That's my but, point, yeah. but what we have done, we built a clinic where we see these patients on a regular basis. We follow them, we help them to work through our day to day life, finding jobs or coping with impairment, and now developing therapies. Uh, so, we characterize the patient uh, both from the genetic standpoint, but also the status of the disease because there is a range of uh, therapies that have been developed, uh, my institute and others over the years, correcting the gene defect, replacing the cells, artificial retina, optogenetics, neuroprotection to protect the remaining cells. All of these are parallel approaches that we are working on for trying to tackle the disease at various stages of the disease because some patients still have remaining vision and we want to retain that, so we work on that too. But in the case of that patient, everything was beyond that point. There was nothing left. Uh, and can I just jump in there again? I appreciate that the story is not, not, not through. You're not through the story yet, but I, I just... It reminds me of a conversation I had recently um, with a geneticist in, 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 uh, in the United States. And this f idea in the field of genetics where, or where some people have said, because it's, you have a genetic condition, society has no responsibility to interact and to do anything. Clearly, you've taken a different approach there. Yeah, so in a sense, even right there, you've broken through a wall where you have said, yeah, that may be genetic, and you could then say, well, we don't have, we don't have, have no responsibility, we don't have to do anything, but you said, actually, we do have responsibility and we can do something if we try hard enough, right? Well, I think it's, for me it's ridiculous because uh, as a physician, any time a patient comes to me and is asking for help, I have to help. I'm not saying yeah. about society or not, I'm not responsible for that. As long as you become a physician, you became in some way responsible to do something mm. or try something. Uh, not being dangerous, obviously, but uh, uh, clearly telling, well, it's none of my business, not me. Uh, for me, it's just beyond the, the scope of medicine. It's just something which has no sense. So there is a, a statement by a very famous philosopher of science called uh, George Canguilhem, a French uh, philosopher, who used to say that uh, once you know that a genetic disease is uh, just a typo in a word in the genetic code, uh, instead of calling that uh, what we say in France a malediction, which is a curse, it becomes 
uh, just a misunderstanding. And the misunderstanding you can fix, a curse you cannot fix. So many of these families, they believe there is a curse on these families because it's a genetic disease and the curse is like something that comes from heaven or from bad luck and there is nothing to do about it. But if you view that as just a misunderstanding and you try to reestablish the right message, you correct the message properly, mm -hmm. then you reestablish the communication. So for me, our role is just to transform global, unsolvable questions that people view as curses into more small items that we can try to correct one by one, very patiently, so that over time we could help people. I'd like you to uh, continue with the story, to, in, but just in one second, I, I'm going to turn sort of gently to the camera and uh, another appeal to our audience out there to, to please um, pose questions. We, we, and, and I've just heard from uh, the voice of God, of a God, that we have a question. Can I, um, can I just, um, int yes, how about that? I can see you are, you are, what's the word? You are spotlighted. So you're there already. I'll keep my mouth shut now. Over to you. Welcome to our conversation. Um, please pose your question. Hello, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I am curious about the current research in ophthalmology. So, um, because there are lots of diseases in, in the eyes, um, and what um, they are all, not all of them, but lots of them are also genetically caused. And what will be possible in five years, in 10 years, what, which technologies are, are the most important um, for this research? I don't know if, if the question is all right. Just tell me if you have any questions for my question. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's a good question. It's a, it's a broad question, so I try to tackle it briefly. Uh, well, first of all, predicting what's going to happen in five to ten years is almost being sure that you're going to be mistaken because many things couldn't be predicted. But what we see currently is the rise of uh, gene therapies to correct the gene defect, to supplement the gene defect. Gene editing, as you know, the Nobel laureate is in Berlin, and uh, uh, really this is a major field, and I'm working on that too with uh, one of the company we formed. But uh, the goal is to correct the gene defect when you can correct the gene defect. Talking about genetic disease, not talking about many other things in ophthalmology that are so promising. But once you get beyond the point where the gene can be corrected because the cells are dead or the cells are dying and there is no point in correcting something in a cell is doomed to die, then the goal is to protect whatever is remaining, and if there is nothing remaining, to restore what has been lost, uh, and this is what we have tried to do with optogenetics or prosthetic vision. So there is a lot of technologies, and this is what we can foresee from what is occurring currently. My next uh, dream is really for people who lost the eye or lost the optic nerve to go directly to the brain, and I'm forming a big team currently about that, trying to stimulate the brain directly because we see with the brain. We don't see, we see through the eyes, but we see with the brain. So the goal would be to really go back to where the vision is formed, but it's a very, very complex process, so we have to be very humble yet on that. I hope that answers your question. Are you, you happy with that? Do you have a follow-up? You, you good? You are muted. Yeah, I see your mouth moving, but... One second, and there you go. Yes, no, because I have the host has to um, accept my uh, sound. <laughs> so, <that's> it. <laughs> no, it's uh, thank you very much. Um, it really uh, it answered my question, thank and. Yeah, I'm also thinking about because another breakthrough I just saw was about like lasers. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of therapy which uh, in the eye, which is about lasers. So I'm curious about how is laser going to be or how is laser, what kind of role does laser play in um, in ophthalmology, oh, it's such a hard word to pronounce, ophthalmology. <laughs> yeah, so we, we use the laser all the time. Actually, ophthalmology was the first medical field that used lasers. So we use laser to coagulate uh, vessels, to destroy tissue that is sick, to prevent extension to other parts of the eye. We use laser to cut in uh, some tissues. We use laser to sculpture the cornea, to correct uh, refractive defects like myopia or others. And uh, we also use laser to 
combined with some drugs to act at the vascular level. Uh, lasers are also used for the artificial retina we develop, where it's uh, providing the energy to, it's like photodiodes, so these photodiodes are detecting the light, but they need amplification. So the laser is providing also the energy to, to amplify the signal. So lasers are all over in ophthalmology as part of the surgery. We also use them for diagnostic tools with very low in intensity, so it's a huge, huge spectrum. But ophthalmology was the first uh, medical uh, discipline to use lasers many, many decades ago. Thank you very much for your questions. Is that, I, I, I just want to come back to, to, to the story as we were talking, but I, I have to sort of ask you this as well, because you said people who have lost their eyes, we see with our brains, we access the light through our eyes, but we see with our brains. And I'm thinking about, for instance, people in India who through this pandemic have had their had eyes removed because of sort of associated conditions um, or in other countries in African countries where we know that there are lots of uh, um, sight related conditions but under researched and we are under under aware of those sorts of things is this something that can be let's say a prosthetic retina or your new approaches here with seeing with the brain you know is that something that would be well, where are we at, and and uh, would it be affordable to countries that do not have the you know the ready money to? Well, it's a major issue. So, well, as long as you are in clinical trials, uh, some clinical trials are done currently in India, for example. And it, it can be affordable because there is no fee to pay for a clinical trial. Once the therapy is approved, and uh, the example is uh, gene therapies I was mentioning, the price tag is very high. So there is some commitment from some of the companies to make it affordable for these countries. How far this will go is an issue. My experience, I've done a lot of, uh, I've worked in, in Africa, I've gone to do surgeries in Africa. Problem is not just the cost, it's also the infrastructure. Is how you deliver the, the, the therapies to the right people. And because of the very complex, bureaucratic, and uh, sometimes corrupted environment you can find in some of these countries, not to be critical of that, but this is a big limitation. Uh, I, my experience is that you come into one of these countries you, you want to do a lot, you want to treat these many patients that are require your surgery, and I'm talking about cataract surgery or glaucoma surgery, but you spend at least one week just to fix the equipment because everything was broken, and, uh, and then having, making sure that people know that there is a surgeon who is coming to the city, and then when they know, you get thousands of people waiting, so, and you know you are going to leave, and so many of them are going to be left behind. So I remember training people, trying to help people once I leave to be able to at least do the follow-ups and the diagnosis Diagnosis. There is also a major issue, which is the early diagnosis of disease, not waiting until people have developed advanced stages where it's too late to be as efficient as you could be early on. So there is a lot of things to do, but the, real, the issue is that we don't have a worldwide approach to health. We have a World Health Organization, but it's powerless. Uh, it just cannot act in these countries, and, uh, and you have in some ways find how to deliver care to all these people. And I think it's a tragedy. I think this is something which uh, all of us should feel so bad about. But anytime you try to do it, you are touching, just scratching the surface of it. So you feel better, but you know that you are leaving behind so many issues that are unsolved. And there is a big, big endeavor that should be taken to provide free care worldwide. But this would require a lot of cooperation with all these governments and all these countries to make it happen. I mean, you know, th th this this pandemic, as, as, as if you know, many of us didn't know it or weren't aware of it, has really highlighted the disparity between haves and have-nots in terms of healthcare. We've really seen that in a, in a in a huge way, where many you know we're getting booster shots, and many people in many countries have yet to get one shot. I mean, is there a fix for that? Because even if at the research level you need to have people from communities where you're going to be delivering. These, uh, 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 these these treatments and what have you. They can't, it can't all be one size fits all for if in, a, in a global sense. We have you know billions of people in the world and if we're heading towards more personalized medicine, then we need to be very personal about that, don't we? Well, I think we have to realize that each human being is a person and uh, 
uh, and that even if a person is 5,000 miles from us, these are people that are important, and uh, we, we have to take care of them. But it's, it goes beyond uh, hunger is a, is a big issue too, just not health, but even hunger. And uh, as we know, even in our countries, uh, what we call the social determinants of health represent more than the majority of the issues. Actually, medicine is touching only the minority of the issues. Most of them is food, uh, exercise, uh, just health conditions like healthy living, uh, clean cleanliness, things like that, that you need to afford, that some people can't afford even in these countries, in our countries. And uh, not to speak about all the countries of this is a luxury for, for me, just to be able to clean yourself, to wash yourself is a luxury. And this is a major part of being sick. Uh, so all of this is beyond science, it's really society that has to think about it as a global world and not, and a global world means individuals. The global world is made of billions of individuals, each of them being as important as the person next to us. But this is something that is so complex and is beyond the uh, ability for each of us to, uh, to tackle that we almost give up on it. We should not. I mean, so yes, scientists and society, but I mean, even s scientists live in society. And yeah. that, that, I mean, that, so that there needs to be a greater interaction there. It's sort of it, what you were just saying that reminds me, I shouldn't really say this, but you know, my, my, my recent visit to the urologist and the doctor said, yeah, well, uh, you know, I apologized. Uh, uh, and then they said, well, sometimes don't, don't, don't worry. We, we struggle to see our patients as people, right? Yeah. Rather than just objects that we have to investigate. Yes. But the doctor, the scientist, the researcher, the entrepreneur out there who has a, you know, a smartphone app that can help you detect sort of uh, um, eye deficiencies in remote areas, yeah. all interacting with society, aren't they? No, they are. But the thing is, uh, we we have to evolve to our society that would be fact-driven and not prejudice-driven. Right. If we look at uh, data, and, uh, and data are reflecting the life of people, yeah. the lives of people, then you can start to work on a solution. When you try just to work on prejudice, that there's nothing to do about these people, it's hopeless, or mm -hmm. uh, this is something that uh, is beyond my reach, and all of this, but facts are, are real, and facts are at least you have checkable, you can check the facts, and once you do that, there is a, you can start a solution. I mean, when you can name a problem, you can start to work on it. When you don't want to name the problem, then you don't work on it, because you work on prejudice. And this is what we are living all around, for many, including uh, the pandemic, uh, this is what we are living all, uh, all the time. And this is, uh, I mean, uh, something which is costing lives every day. Mm. Some very uh, stark um, comments you make, and, and very good ones, so I thank you for that. Um, just as we're coming up against the clock, bring us to the sort of, sort of fast forward, your, your, your patient. Uh, yeah so, the the yeah, so the technology we, we developed is a combination of uh, a gene therapy to administer a protein that was identified actually by German scientists in algae that algae are using to detect the light and respond to light. Very simple, very rudimentary, very robust mechanism. We get these proteins expressed in the retina by gene therapy. We develop these goggles that I showed today that are capturing the light and triggering a signal to this. And then once the wiring or Occurs, we train the brain of a patient, the patient is training himself or herself to learn how to see because this signal is not natural at all. Oh. And so it's a combination of gene therapy, medical device and training, uh, which is uh, some convergence of many technologies around one single patient. Now more patients are coming up, but uh, this is uh, what we develop for this patient in this individual. And this patient is, I presume, happy. <laughs> he's happy to be part of an adventure. He knows it's a, it's a one step, it's partial results, but he's happy, he said that I showed the movie, this is hopeful, this is, yeah. A, yeah. Fantastic, it, it sounds like really, I mean, obviously, as, as if you need me to tell you, very vital research, and uh, I congratulate you on these steps. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. It's, I mean, eyesight is just so amazingly important, isn't it? And I'm sort of yes. just shocked on a personal level how, how few insurance companies, even in our sort of luxurious uh, European countries, refuse to pay for glasses. Um, you know, uh, because as if eyesight was not important. Um, Jose Alain Sayer, thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Thank I'm going to give you a fist bump as I've been doing with everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, for your time, for coming and joining us here. Um, this has been another 
break, uh, falling walls breaking a breakthrough conversation. Um, we're going to take a, a lunch break now. We'll be back in an hour, which is uh, 2 p.m. Central European time, 2 p.m. Berlin time. So please come back and join us for yet more breakthrough conversations. Thank mm -hmm. you.